Welcome back to another edition of Songs of the Ozarks, a project of the Ozark Studies Institute, an ongoing initiative of the Missouri State University Libraries. My name is Emily Flatness Combs, and today's date is November 24th, 2023. Our special guest today is the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. D.A. Calloway, and we are meeting here at a place very special to him, Silver Dollar City. That's right. And today we are inside the McAfee Homestead. Yes. Another very special place. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Thank you so much for meeting with us today, yes. Mr. Calloway. Um, You're welcome. Now, my first question is, are you a native of the Ozarks region? Pretty much. When I was about one year old, my family moved back to Missouri from California, where my father had been in the Navy. So I don't remember California, but my birthplace was Santa Barbara, California, but I've lived here virtually since I was a little baby. So um, was your family from the Ozarks originally? Yes, absolutely, yes. Wow. Generations up around Willard, from there to Greenfield, to Arcola, to Jericho Springs, and uh, back in that country, <laughs> that's, where, <laughs> that's where my family has been for a long time. Wow. Um, so you, did you say Arcola? Yes. Well, that's a tiny little Ozarks town. Yeah, it's not much there anymore, but at one time it was a trading center. No kidding? Yes. Um, so how did your, um, how did you end up here in Taney County? in Stone County. Well, I was living in Greene County where I'd grown up and gone through school at Willard. And then I was about uh, 25 years old and a friend of mine had already been working at Silver Dollar City. Richard Valdick is his name. And Richard called and said, we need somebody to come play the piano at the medicine show for the rest of the season, which would have been about eight weeks of work. And so I was working for somebody else and I told, I told my employer, if it's okay, I'll be back in eight weeks. But I never did go back and I just stayed here. And so that was a good deal. I auditioned for the piano part for the medicine show. And uh, I, it turns out I was the only one that auditioned. They didn't have much choice. So <laughs> I played one song and the manager says, you're hired. And I went to work that day. Wow. <laughs> what year was that that you started? It was 76. Wow. Um, so was your family and your ancestors musical? Absolutely. My mother was a great singer. She sang alto in church, so I stood by her. So I learned that part when I was a little kid. You know, I learned to sing the alto part, and that still is the line that comes to me if I'm called on to sing harmony. That's the first, that's my first choice. But I learned to sing the other parts, too. I have three brothers, and so when we were little kids, mother formed us into a quartet, and she'd dress us in suits and would sing in church or funerals or weddings or wherever she could get, wherever she could find a place for us to sing. And she played piano enough to pick out the parts. Here's what you're going to sing. She'd play us our parts on the piano, and then we'd memorize that and go from there. Wow. <laughs> um. Would you say there is um, a great difference in the musical communities in Greene County versus this area? Oh, not that I know of. Uh, possibly years ago, yes. But now everything is so homogenized. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's much difference in the music in Greene County and Taney <laughs> County or Stone County. Have you seen a great difference in um, the music here in Branson, the Branson area since you moved here versus now? Absolutely. There were uh, three music shows in Branson, I think, the year I came to work in Branson. And uh, then that just blossomed and there were, I don't know how many at the max, there were maybe 90 or 100. Now it's not so much music shows now, it's family attractions. But at one time, the music shows were the basis of the industry in Branson. And uh, yeah, I'd say it's changed a lot. Wow. <laughs> um, would, is there more of a focus on old time and bluegrass music? A uh, little bit. Now here at Silver Dollar City, when I first started to work here, mm -hmm. uh, 
bluegrass was a pretty new music. And the producer of the original Mountain Folks Music Festival, which started in 1975, I was very familiar with a lot of those players because I just grew up in the area. And Max Hunter was the talent buyer and the producer of that show. And Max was adamant that all the songs that you played had to be public domain, which meant you couldn't play any of Bill Monroe's music or you couldn't play any Flat and Scruggs music. It was too modern. So the music of the Mountain Folks Music Festival was folk music. It predated bluegrass. And then gradually we worked bluegrass music into that and the rules were relaxed a little bit and it eventually morphed into a full-blown bluegrass festival. Wow. But it took a long time to get there. <laughs> did you know uh, Max Hunter I did quite not. Well. But I had met Max, but of course he didn't know who I was. And, and I just in passing, you know, just kind of a handshake. And that's about <laughs> of course I knew him. But uh, Gordon McCann worked for Max and was kind of his protege. And of course, uh, Gordon just carried on that traditional work of collecting music that Max was doing. And I was thrilled to know Gordon McCann, and, and we became friends and wound up in the same little uh, parties and jam sessions and whatnot over the years. Oh. <laughs> um, you what? know, uh, Vance Randolph was a pretty famous folklorist and writer and uh, documented a lot of music, and uh, Max Hunter had worked for him. And so when Gordon McCann came along, this was actually the third generation of folklore collections. And uh, I know that you're continuing that work yourself. <laughs> I um, am very honored that you would say that. <laughs> um, so you briefly mentioned um, bluegrass being quite a new style of music. Right. Would you mind describing, um, in your words, the difference between old time and bluegrass music? Oh, it's more or less the year that the songs were written. Mm. That would typify that, of course. Uh, in the 40s, when Earl Scruggs came along, uh, Scruggs changed the way we looked at the banjo. <laughs> Not just the design of the banjo, which used to be mostly open back banjos. Mm. And of course the tenor banjo, the four string banjo, and the plectrum banjo was very, very popular during the 1920s and 1930s, uh, basically because of the uh, menstrual movement and, the, and jazz, all Vinnie jazz, you know, it predates the five string banjo. But when Earl Scruggs started playing the three-finger style banjo and he showed that to the world, that's really when bluegrass took off. Well, Bill Monroe already had a band called the Bluegrass Boys. I think, in my opinion, bluegrass was invented by Earl Scruggs mm -hmm. and the, the five-string banjo. Wow. <laughs> um, back in 
or at least in my church, they taught that Jesus and the disciples were General Baptist. Oh, okay. that, they, that their church goes back to that time, which historically would <laughs> be pretty hard to prove. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the clergy, the clergy in that day and age were not seminary trained preachers. They were just basically rural people that felt they were called to preach mm. and felt a desire to lead the people and start a church. And uh, so the preachers that I grew up around were not especially educated people. They all had to work for a living because the pastor of a church didn't get paid anything. They did it as an, on a volunteer basis. And they were women preachers. I remember distinctly several really good women preachers. And the preachers in that time in the church I grew up in, when they preached about hell, you could smell smoke. They, they, <laughs> <laughs> they really like to bear down on that. And so, and I appreciate the old songs, the old ragged old paperback songbooks that we used in church courses poor community that I grew up in, so they didn't have hardback hymnals. They just had secondhand songbooks from wherever they got them. And uh, I love those old songs. Um, was your church in Willard? On the northwest side of Springfield. Okay. Pretty near where the airport of Springfield is. Okay. That's the neighborhood that I grew up in. But at that time, the city limits of Springfield was east of where we lived. So now, even though it's inside the city limits of Springfield at that time, it wasn't, it was outside the city, which is why my brothers and myself went through school at Willard, because if we'd lived about a block to the east, we'd have gone to Central High School in Springfield. Really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and whenever you guys were in churches, little folks, what, what kind of instruments were played? Mainly just piano. Really? In church, yeah. Now, sometimes mother would let us escape to the Pentecostal church. Really? Which we love that <laughs> because the Pentecostal church had an electric guitar player, they had a piano, of course, but they might have a drummer and they might have an electric bass. Really? Which, to me, that was like going to a rock concert when yeah. I was a kid. You know, we get to go to the Pentecostal church, and their, oh, their style of dress and their style of speaking and their style and the speaking in tongues is so fascinating to me. And and their preaching style is a little bit different in the Pentecostal church, which, by the way, predates what we call Assembly of God now. The Assembly of God church sprang off of the original Pentecostal movement. There's a something I've never experienced, but have heard a lot about. Did you have any experiences with snakes? <laughs> I never did. Church. Of course, the old joke was that when you get far enough out in the country, even the Presbyterians handle snakes. <laughs> but no, I never was around anybody that handled snakes in the church service. I only heard about it. Yeah, I guess it's just an elusive. Ozark's tradition. <laughs> well, I think it's more of an Appalachian. Oh, yeah. Thing. I don't know that. I never even heard of that around here when I was a kid. Yeah. I've only heard uh, jokes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Is there a back door? Where would you like one? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, did your siblings play instruments? Yes. In fact, uh, mother saw to it that all of us played an instrument. So, you know, my older brother, he was two years older than I, and uh, he was a good brass player. Really? When, in fact, when he, in his adult life, he was a high school band director. But he was a good trumpet player, good tuba player, and he played all the brass instruments. And one of my other brothers played clarinet, and then one of my other brothers played the flute, and I got to play whatever was left over. He went through school playing the baritone horn, although I was always a closet trumpet player. Really? So 
In fact, at one time in my career, I had a job playing the trumpet. Eleven years, I made a living playing the trumpet. Wow. <laughs> and at Silver Dollar City? Yes, that's right. At one time, this would have been the early 80s, uh, Silver Dollar City had a Dixieland jazz band. And it was called the Volunteer Fireman's Band. And that trumpet player that was in that band, Larry Getz, now passed on, mm -hmm. was a tremendous Al Hurt type trumpet player. And he in, developed a health issue that he couldn't play anymore. And I decided that I was going to try to get Larry's job. So I started going to Springfield, taking trumpet lessons from a guy. And I got my chops up, and I auditioned for that job. And I wound up as the trumpet player. About that time, they changed the name of the band to the River Rats. And so I played in the six-piece Dixieland jazz band the River Rats, although it wasn't strictly Dixieland jazz. We played a lot of novelty music, and we drew from so many sources. Uh, we drew from uh, Spike Jones Orchestra and the Hoosier Hot Shots and even Homer and Jethro, mm -hmm. you know, and we found out that just to play music was one thing, but if you want to hold a crowd, you've got to try to be entertaining. In fact, the basic thing you've got to do is to do something to keep the audience from walking off, mm. whatever that happens to be. And so we experimented with several things. We found out that the novelty songs and the goofy songs, uh, that was, that's what we really needed to do. And we focused on that. We played a lot of traditional jazz, but we always threw in the goofy material too. Wow. <laughs> what sort of relationship does the Dixieland jazz genre have with the Ozarks region? Very little, in fact. <laughs> Very little. I don't think there is any. You know, Silver Dollar City is a fantasy world, and it is whatever you imagine it is, and that, that goes back to the inception of Silver Dollar City, I think. We mm -hmm. had, you know, at one time they said that we had a, oh, a fellow named Harold Goad, I think was the first musician at Silver Dollar City. He had later on had a family band called the Village Singers, who were notorious and a great band. Mm. But when Harold was a young man, he would lead a mule around Silver Dollar City, perhaps it was a burrow, and he would have a guitar and a banjo and a mandolin strapped to the saddle horn of the animal, and so he could stop whenever he found a group of people he could stop and sing a song, play them a song, and I think that was the start of the music program at Silver Dollar City. Wow. <laughs> when did, uh, mu I mean, I would say music has sort of been a focus of Silver Dollar City since I've been coming here. Yes. When would you say that uh, sort of became the case? Well, at one time we had a lot of house bands. When I first came to Silver Dollar City, there were no microphones, there were no sound systems. Uh, a band didn't have a stage. A band would be under a shade tree, and you could walk maybe 200 feet and you'd see the next band under a shade tree. I think at one time we had 20 house bands here, in the summertime especially. And uh, a lot of those kids grew up to be tremendous players. I know that. Uh, my friend Rhonda Vincent played here with her two brothers and her mom and dad, and they had a show called the Sally Mountain Show. And they would play weekends other places, but during the week they would come back to Silver Dollar City and play here on the stage, and they played outside, and that's how I, that's how I got to know the Vincent family. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, did, where did the River Rats play most of the time? Sometimes at the, at the gazebo. Okay. Which uh, at that time, and, and maybe this still continues, I think, when you first come through the front gate, you want your first impression to be a certain thing. You're yeah. trying to paint a picture, of course, as we all do with our lives. We're painting a picture of who we are and what we think, and Silver Dollar City is keenly aware of painting that picture. And so sometimes it would be the River Rat, sometimes it would be the Horse Creek Band, sometimes it would be the Sally Mountain Show. And then we played uh, for years at the Dockside Theater. Okay. 
You know, what we think of as the Dockside Theater now is actually the third Dockside Theater. Really? The original was improved, enlarged, which was the second one, and then they built the one they've got now in the same location. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, were the River Rats part of the reason it was named Dockside Theater? No, I think it was just coincidental. That area was called the Riverfront area. Oh, and of okay. course, they built the Playhouse, which is originally called the Courthouse, and then changed to the Meeting Hall, and then the Riverfront Playhouse. And that area of Silver Dollar City is still known as Rivertown or Riverfront. Wow. And so that theme of water, which water's always at the bottom of the hill, that was at the bottom of Silver Dollar City, and they had Lake Silver down there. Sometimes they called it a river, the Lost River, as in the Lost River ride. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it was just called Lake Silver. But the Dockside Theater was adjacent to that, so that's why it was called the Dockside Theater. Gotcha. Um, before you started playing at Silver Dollar City, what mus musical genre was most interesting to you as a young fellow? My mother had an eclectic taste in music. Really? She had uh, Frank Sinatra records. She had Southern Gospel Quartet records. She had uh, Mahalia Jackson really? records. So she liked all kinds of music and she was a great singer. And so we just listened to whatever she had on the record player, you know. Mm -hmm. So I had a wide influence and then my friend Richard Valdick, who I said was instrumental in getting me my job here. Mm -hmm. I grew up with Richard. His family collected vinyl records, but they collected jazz. They collected jazz from the 19, from the teens, you know, when jazz was first invented, when mm -hmm. phonograph records were first invented. They had those old 78 records all the way up through the 20s, 30s, and 40s. So when I was at Richard's house, which was often, I got to listen to great piano players, uh, Fats Waller, Jelly Roll Morton, U.B. Uh, Blake, and I got to listen to a lot of primitive jazz, you know, the first generation of jazz players. When jazz was first invented, uh, I got to listen to a lot of that, and it was very influential on me, and I wanted to play piano like Fats Waller. <laughs> And you are also a very talented bass player. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> My theory on playing bass is keep it simple and don't mm. stop. Oh, that's because, great advice. Yeah, a bass player doesn't need to be, in my view, playing a lot of notes. Mm. You want to keep it simple because that is the foundation of the band. And if you're always hot dogging and slapping the bass, you're really distracting from the, what should be the focus of the band. Mm -hmm. So the foundation of that band is the bass, and that bass needs to be straight time, in tune, at the same time. <laughs> if you can do that, <laughs> that's what a bass player is to me, and that's the style of bass I want to play. Oh, I want to yeah. keep it simple and don't stop. That's lovely. <laughs> Thanks. Um, do you play other instruments besides the ones we have mentioned? I don't play any instruments anymore except piano and bass. Really? I'm fortunate enough to have a piano in my home and I play almost every day. Oh, that's wonderful. And, uh, yeah, and that piano, the piano has become, through my life, the piano is maybe my best friend because if I was lonely or alone or whatever, I could go to that piano and get my emotions out, mm -hmm. you know. And so that's been a great thrill for me to, to play piano and to have that piano as my buddy. I'm not a great player, but I play what I play, you know. Just like John Hartford said, style is based on limitation. Well, I've got a lot of lim <laughs> limitations, so maybe I've got my own style. I think you're one of the best I've ever heard. <laughs> you are. Um, Thank you. So, Greg Becker, another longtime Silver Dollar City employee, you guys started the same year, didn't you? Greg started the year before I did. Okay. Greg had a folk music band that he played in with his late 
spouse and a couple of other good musicians, and they didn't play bluegrass. They were playing folk music. They were yeah. playing authentic, collectible mountain music. Mm -hmm. And Greg played hammer dulcimer, and he played upright bass, and he played rhythm guitar some. And uh, there was so much fun to know Greg Becker. He just has a delightful personality, and he's got an unbelievable memory for lyrics. Mm -hmm. He knows a lot of songs, and he can memorize songs so quickly. And he specializes in songs that have a lot of words. You know, he can just rattle off all these. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> but he, he's an amazing man. But you know, he's also a very accomplished drummer. When he was a kid, he grew up in the St. Louis area, which is known for jazz, and uh, he played in the kid band through high school, you know, he played drums, and uh, he and I first worked together with me playing the piano and him playing drums at Shad Heller's Toby show in Branson, Missouri. There was wow. the mayor of Silver Dollar City, Shad Heller, and his wife, Ruth, everybody called her Aunt Molly, and uh, they owned the little theater called the Corn Crib Theater. It seated about 200, and it was an open roof theater. Now the stage was covered, but it was, uh, and they had a wooden fence around the audience area, you know, to kind of keep out the traffic noise because it was right on 76 Highway. Really? And so Greg and I played together, and we called ourselves the Smith Brothers because the traditional cough drops box has two bearded fellas on the cover and the name of the cough drops is the Smith Brothers. So we named ourselves the Smith Brothers <laughs> and we played in that configuration off and on for a long time. Wow. <laughs> he had told me something about you guys playing a puppet show yes. in Springfield. Yes, the uh, Chameleon Puppet Theater was, uh, they did a lot of original shows and designed their own puppets and their focus was entertaining school children. So they would rent a space. Sometimes it was the theater at the Springfield Art Museum. Sometimes it was at the Vandevoort Center or some other theater that would accommodate two or 300 people. And Springfield schools would bus third and fourth graders to the shows. So you'd do maybe two or three shows a day to different crowds. but. It also gave Greg and I an opportunity to invent our own music as the puppet theater management and staff, as they were creating the shows, we would be creating original music to go along with the show. And that was so much fun. And we did that every winter for a few winters. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you still um, like creating original music? Not so much anymore. I've written a few piano tunes. Really? Uh, but uh, I don't have the passion for inventing tunes <laughs> as much <laughs> as I do collecting tunes. Mm. Because now I'm really hung up on, on songs that were at one time hits, maybe number one hits in the country, and now nobody knows anything about them. They've just been, they've gone on to obscurity. You know, there's songs. There's a song called "I Love You a Bushel and a Peck." Well, a lot of people know that line of that song, but they uh -huh. don't know the whole song. But it's a very interesting song. It's got a great chord progression in it. You know, and the song uh, "What a Wonderful World." You know, at one time that was like the top song in the world. Well, yeah. very few people even know what it is anymore. And again, it's it was a tremendous chord progression and a beautiful melody. And so, rather than write my own music. <laughs> There's so much music out there that's just great that why would I go to the trouble and try to make up something better? I can just learn these old songs and that's fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> um, now Shad Heller is quite a legendary figure. People still talk about him all the time. Yes, Shad Heller was, uh, he'd been a Ringling Brothers clown. He'd been a businessman. He was at one time, I think, the mayor of Flagstaff, Arizona. He, is a, uh, he was a reformed alcoholic, and to hear him tell some of his tales, and he was a traveling hobo for a while. What? And rode freight trains, and yeah, was 
lived the hobo life, you know, and he, he remembered a lot of those people that he met while riding the rails. And uh, one time he woke up and he said, I think I'll quit drinking, and he did. And uh, so that allowed him to be a pretty good life coach because he had so many experiences, you know, of walking a, maybe a darker path. I don't think knowing Shad, he never was evil of any in any way, but mm -hmm. I think he just found a better way to live. Yeah. Was he a native Ozarker, do you know? No, I think he wasn't. I think he was from Arizona. In fact, one of his longtime friends was uh, Barry Goldwater, who was a significant senator and even ran for president, I think, in 64 maybe. But anyway, he was a very good friend of uh, Barry Goldwater's, and I'm sure he grew up in the Arizona area. Um, so what makes Shad so legendary still here at Silver Dollar City? Shad was a good listener. Mm -hmm. He knew the questions to ask, and he was a good life coach. And he was somebody that could tell you you're messing up without hurting your feelings. That's a skill. It is. Um, and he was in the Beverly Hillbillies episodes here, wasn't he? <laughs> yes, <laughs> he was. Yeah, he made good friends with the, the cast. And he and Irene, who played Granny, uh, became very good friends. Mm -hmm. And then Paul Henning was the producer of that show, and Shad and Molly got to be good friends with Paul Henning. In fact, he, Paul bought a significant tract of land between here and Branson and deeded it to the state of Missouri for a national or for a state park. Mm -hmm. And it's still there, of course. Wow. And was his wife called Aunt Molly because of Shepherd of the Hills? Yes, she was the original Aunt Molly in Shepherd of the Hills. In fact, yeah. Shad Heller was the original Shepherd. In fact, he was the person, now this is from him, mm -hmm. he was the person that took Harold Bell Wright's book and turned it into a stage play. Really? And then he was eventually, I don't know how, he got out of that scene and came to Silver Dollar City, left Shepherd of the Hills after a few years, he came to Silver Dollar City and became the mayor of Silver Dollar City and became the iconic uh, photogenic spokesperson for Silver Dollar City. But he was the original shepherd at Shepherd in the Hills, and that's where Aunt Molly got her name, Aunt Molly, from playing Aunt Molly at Shepherd of the Hills pageant. So um, was that whenever the show was on the lake, whenever Shad? was involved? I don't think so. Now, as far as I know, I don't remember the <laughs> Shepherd of the Hills show ever being on the mm. lake. And it likely was, but I have no knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. Right. It was always over there by old Matt's cabin. Wow. Um, so another question I have, and this is a little bit off topic, <laughs> but I'm so interested in the auto heart. Um, I watched a documentary about Silver Dollar City, just a local documentary in 1976, and there were so many auto harp players. Um, and I don't know a single auto harp player besides Greg Becker well, anymore. <laughs> the original country music family who made a lot of the original recordings was the Carter family. Maybelle Carter, who was AP's daughter, played auto harp and they were on so many records back in those days that the auto harp was very popular because Mother Maybell popularized the auto harp. Well, if you've ever played rhythm guitar or if you've ever chorded a song on the piano, you can play the auto harp because the auto harp keys have the name of the chord on the key that you're depressing. Oh, wow. So as you play that chord, just say you're playing an A, You've got your A, D, and E chords right there next to each other. So if you're playing a song in the key of A, you don't have very far to, you're just pushing buttons and strumming the strings. Oh, that's lovely. And the other harp is playing the song for you. So we had some hot rod auto harp players over the years. In fact, uh, Little Roy Lewis is probably mm. best known right now as a hot rod oh, yes. auto harp player. And, and because 
he has learned to play the melody, which a lot of the old time auto harp players did not play the melody, they just played chords. But Little Roy knows how to pick the auto harp and he can play the melody of the song on the auto harp, which is unusual, but Little Roy is unusual too. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> um, why do you think it has sort of drifted? Things change. Things the one change. thing that we hate in this life is change. Amen. And it's the only thing you can count on. Oh, amen. Things are going to be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So don't don't ever get <laughs> settled into what it what is right now because it's going to change. Tomorrow's a new day. You know, That's so new true. sun comes up. We got a brand new day, and thinking will change, and people will change, and everything in society will change. Silverdale, our city has certainly changed throughout the years and with the times. Oh, absolutely. I think Silverdale City, I don't think, now I knew Mary Hershand a little bit because she took the time to know the people that worked here. When I first worked here in 76, Mary was still active in the management of the park and she took time to memorize everybody's name if you worked here, she knew your first name. And uh, that's so cool. Now, you couldn't possibly now. There are too many employees. <laughs> yeah. Nobody could remember everybody's name now. But anyway, that was, oh yeah, it's changed a lot. In fact, at one time during the October days, this would predate uh, the Fall Festival or the National Harvest Festival or what we now call Pumpkin Nights. Mm. Uh, predating that in October, we weren't having a festival the last couple of weeks of October, and there would be virtually a ghost town. We were open for business, but maybe we'd have a day when we only had 800 people here. Wow. You almost had to go out of your way to look for somebody to, to talk to. It was just such a slim attendance, and it was mostly seniors. They were interested in cultural heritage, which all seniors, as far as I know, are interested in cultural heritage. <laughs> and that's what Silver Dog City had to offer, and that's mm -hmm. what Silver Dog City was built on. Long before we knew Silver Dog City was a theme park, we didn't know it was a theme park. We thought it was a recreation of an old-time Ozarkian village, which it was, and in a way it still is, especially architecturally and like mm -hmm. the way I dress, the way you dress. You know, we're paying homage to the old time <laughs> ways of living. Mm -hmm. And I think that has changed too as we started, as Branson developed and as Silver Dollar City developed, as we found out what we really want here is to attract as many families as possible to come to Branson, to come to Silver Dollar City. We began to build rides, which our original rides were a stagecoach ride, uh, the flooded mine. The steam train ride, we had a merry-go-round that was powered by a mule. You know, those things, I remember fondly all those things, you know, but now we're building roller coasters, which would have been <laughs> unheard of back in those days, you know. Nobody could imagine that you would build a time traveler or an outlaw run right. back then, but that's that's what's selling tickets now. And of course, our shows are way, vastly upgraded. At one time, I think when I went to work in Branson, if you knew three chords and owned your own capo, you could get a job playing music. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that way anymore. Mm -hmm. The uh, level of accomplishment in all the performers, the singers, dancers, actors, musicians here, way above what the standard used to be. Wow. And, uh, I'm just... I'm just so proud of that, that we're developed in that way. Mm -hmm. And that now we're attracting people from not just Nashville or Kansas City or Springfield, but from all over. Our performers come from all over the United States. Mm -hmm. It's very exciting to be a it part is, of it. It is just very exciting. Um, something else I'm interested in is um, your time between the river rats and where you are today. Would you mind describing a little bit of that history? <laughs> yes. Well, as we mentioned earlier, everything changes and nothing is forever. Mm -hmm. And so in 1992, 
my boss, who happened to be the first person I worked with in 76, his name was Rex Burdett. And Rex was the manager of the Mountain Folks Music Festival, which had continued since the days of Max Hunter. So Rex was in charge of that. And Rex came to me one day and he said, what would you do if you were riding a horse and the horse died? So I thought, what's he trying to tell me? <laughs> so I looked into it a little bit. He was trying to tell me that I should not expect to play the trumpet for the rest of my life. Oh. I should not expect the River Rats Dixieland Jazz Band to go on forever and ever until we all drop dead. You know, that I should be looking for something else. And I said, well, what would you suggest I would do? He said, I want you to learn my job because there's something else I want to do. So he trained me in being a talent scout. And I traveled around with Rex and we went to festivals and conventions and he taught me to write contracts and he taught me to negotiate with people and he taught me so much about a new way of making a living. It so happened that when I was in college I took a lot of accounting classes just for something to do and then here all of a sudden that's come in handy. <laughs> I was using that that mm -hmm. I never thought I would use. <laughs> and Rex was such a great coach. And he was kind of a, oh, he was kind of a grown up hoodlum. He liked practical jokes. Mm -hmm. And if he could pull a practical joke on you, he would. In fact, I want to tell you a story about the day I met Rex Burdett. My first day at Silver Dollar City. Rex Burdett was the medicine man who was the main character in the medicine show. So I was the lowly piano player. <laughs> he took me over here to Hill Street and he had a little red wagon. And he says, here's something we like to do. We'd take turns riding this little red wagon down Hill Street. Okay, I thought, he knows more about it than I do. I'm a newbie, I'll do it. He said, you go first. He put me in the red wagon and he shoved me down the hill. I'd made it about 20 feet when the wheels started coming off of that wagon. And here I'm sliding down Hill Street, which is at a pretty good angle, on just nothing but a steel frame, the carriage, the undercarriage of that little red wagon. No way to steer it. No way to stop it. And when it finally did come to a stop, I looked around and Rex was gone. He not only had he abandoned me, that wasn't his wagon. He'd borrowed it from somebody. And here I'd torn up the wagon, and the lady that owned the wagon was furious. Oh, no. <laughs> but this is Rex's personality. That's just, and he made it right somehow. Oh, that's good. <laughs> but several times Rex did things along that line that made him memorable. And when Rex was teaching me to be a talent buyer, Rex said, the most important thing you can do is to make people remember you. He said, even if you have to spill your coffee on somebody, make them remember you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and so you have to invent your own personality, of course, like anything. You've got to sell yourself mm -hmm. in that situation. So when I started going to IBM and I started going to the Spigma conventions and I started going to some of the other festivals, I tried to be memorable in what I wore and what I said and where I sat in the audience, you know, the most important thing that he taught me in the festival situation was, you gotta know the MC. You gotta sell yourself to the MC. Then you've gotta seat yourself in the audience in a place where the MC can't miss seeing you. Wow. And the best thing that can happen, and this happened so many times, the MC would say, well look over there, there's the fellow that books the shows at Silver Dollar City. Well, that paid for the ticket and the whole trip right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that was a good thing to know. So, you know, the other thing he taught me was carry candy in your pocket. And as you see people, you meet people. Hi, how you doing? Hey, would you like a chocolate? And just hand them a piece of Dove chocolate or a little Halloween candy bar or whatever. That person's going to remember you. You know, and at Spigma, for the first couple of years I went, I was known as the Candy Man. I wasn't known as D.A. Calloway. I was known as, who are you care of the Candy Man? Well, that puts your face, connects you with the, the 
musicianship and the musicians, you know, and that, that's a good way to get to know people. And so, as I say, you sell yourself first. You sell the product second, but first you sell yourself. Wow. And Rex taught me that. That's wonderful advice. <laughs> oh, yeah. Rex changed my life. He was a mm -hmm. great influence. Mm -hmm. When did um, the Mountain Music Festival change into the Bluegrass and Barbecue Festival? Well, the Bluegrass and the Mountain Folks Music Festival changed into another festival, and I think it was called the Folk, it was called the American, it, yeah, from Mountain Folks Music Festival, it went to the Festival of American Music. Oh, okay. And so, during that era, when Rex was still in charge of that, we not only booked bluegrass and folk music, we booked southern gospel quartets, Wow. We booked barbershop quartets. We booked uh, vintage jazz bands. And so there was all this going on. There was a, a multi-level of a convention or the festival that happened here had lots of different kinds of music. And then one year, uh, this was after Brad Thomas took over the company, he decided we were going to have a three-day event called Red, White, and Bluegrass weekend and it was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday and he let me book that show and so we booked uh, David Parmley mm -hmm. and we booked David Davis and the Warrior River Boys, we booked the Larry Stevenson band mm -hmm. and we booked a bunch of local regional bands and we had this three-day festival. Well it was an experiment but it made money. The next year Brad Thomas changed the name of that to Bluegrass and Barbecue. And at the height of Bluegrass and Barbecue, we were running 23 days of a festival. Nine stages every day. I can't tell you, dozens of bands. And it took a good lot of the year to put that together. <laughs> oh yeah. And so that way I got to know a lot of these musicians and I like to, when I turn on the radio, turn on the Bluegrass Channel, I like to say, I know that person, I can name that singer, I can name that banjo player, I can name that bass player. And uh, even though the music continues to change, I still like to do that. Mm -hmm. If I'm listening to a song, I'll say, I may not mean anything to anybody else, but to me, I know that guy. I know Doyle Lawson. Mm -hmm. I can name the members of his band for the last several years. You know, and I, I like that, and uh, it's something that my spouse has just had to put up with. <laughs> She's an angel. <laughs> my spouse is an angel. We met July 4th, 1976, the bicentennial day of the United States of America. It was America's birthday, and I was playing pre-show at an outdoor stage, playing piano, and Earl Scruggs' review was to play that day. After I played and before Earl played, the show rang out. But I had already met Mary, and she was there taking pictures. She had this old, well, she had an icon camera, very nice camera, and she worked for a photo lab at the time. You remember photo labs? <laughs> and and uh, she worked for the F-Stop company, and she had that Nikon camera, and she was taking pictures around the festival, and that's when I met her. So I was the piano player, and she was the photographer. And uh, we just headed off, and I don't know, the next year we got married, and oh. <laughs> we've had all this history since. Does Mary play or sing? She sings pretty well, but really? she's never learned to play an instrument. Yeah, I don't, yeah, she's never had an interest in playing an instrument. Mm -hmm. I don't think. Now, there's been several uh, bluegrass music contests over the years, is that correct? Yes. Uh, at one point, we decided that the way we could be introduced to up-and-coming talent, you can't be everywhere at once. And we decided that if we would have a contest We'd have a band contest, and the people that would come to that contest would become a pool 
of musicians that we could tap into when we needed a band or we needed a musician or we needed a guitar player for such and such a band. And we wanted to be the go-to when somebody's when somebody quit Joe Blow's band out there in the country. We wanted them to call Silver Dollar City and say, do you know any banjo players? Mm -hmm. Because we wanted to be that central clearinghouse. Mm -hmm. And that allowed us to develop a talent pool. So we, we started the Youth and Bluegrass Band Program, which has been running 25 years, I think. Wow. Uh, the first year we had eight bands and we had, we had the contest at the gazebo, had about 80 people we eventually got to where we were having over a thousand people come to that contest. And at the, the biggest, when I was involved, uh, we had 23 bands was the main, main band. We had 23 bands representing 11 states. Wow. So we've got all these people coming here and all these kids getting to know each other and the aunts and uncles and moms and dads, grandpas and grandmas all become friends and through social networking and and just seeing each other over the country became lifelong friends. And through that Youth and Bluegrass Band pro program, I know of at least three couples that met at that program that got married later and started their own bluegrass family. <laughs> 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 so that so makes me cycle. feel good. So <laughs> I'm kind of a bluegrass uncle to all these kids. Oh, yes. Right? <laughs> um, I remember whenever I was 16 and I got Facebook and you sent me a Facebook friend request. I was sitting in the Taco Bell line in Willard, Missouri with my dad. <laughs> and I said, Dad, you will never guess who just sent me a friend request. Well, I must have heard something positive about oh, you. Oh, that's I good. I've never done that. <laughs> um, well, I know so many kids who wouldn't be playing music today without the Youth and Bluegrass Contest. Yes, I feel like we have been blessed to be in the position to encourage people. And here at the Homestead, how many young people have grown up listening to the Homestead Pickers and decided, I think I'll learn to play the mandolin, mm -hmm. you know, or sing a song or whatever. Yes. And uh, that's been a great thing, so. It has been. <laughs> you retired. Yes. And then you ended back at, up back at Silver Dollar City. Well, Emily, I didn't actually retire. Oh, okay. I left my management job. Mm -hmm. And my spouse has put up with me being a Silver Dollar City soldier. And I say it because it is kind of like being in the Army. When they need you, you're there. Mm. In fact, in all situations, we require... Um, we, re we require people that will fulfill their obligations. Mm -hmm. We only demand accountability of people who will be accountable. Mm -hmm. And the whole world is that way. I want to be accountable. Yes. And so not only was I married to Mary almost 50 years, I've been married to Silver Dollar City <laughs> <laughs> about the same amount of time. And at some point, it was, it was time to move on. I had had a couple of protégés who were ready to move up. They knew everything I knew. I traveled with these people. I taught them everything I knew. They knew spreadsheets, contracts. It was time for me to get out of the way and let them move up. And so I decided to do that. Mary approved that. But I didn't want to quit Silver Dollar City. I would just want to leave my management job to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so, consequently, as the way it turned out, I wound up sleeping at night, a lot less to worry about, you know, and mm -hmm. a lot less responsibility, even though my true love to come out here and talk to these people and meet people and say, hey, where you're from, or, you know, just to get to know people, not only the guests that come here, but the people that work at Silver Dollar City, because everybody's got a story. Mm -hmm. All these people you see at Silver Dollar City, you see somebody that may be uh, cleaning a restroom or cleaning a street or cooking hamburgers or whatever, you can say, what, what did you do in the real world? And it's mm -hmm. fascinating to find out where people came from and what they believed in and what led them to the Ozarks. Now, I love knowing all that. So, no, I didn't really retire 
I just change jobs. So now I get to do whatever. Sometimes I'm the divisional host. I got to play Santa Claus in the Christmas parade a couple of years. You know, I'm now working as a, a usher, a greeter at the Red Gold Heritage Hall. But uh, I've done many things over the years. Rob trains, I was in the street shows. I was, you know, I washed dishes here. I drove a delivery truck for the park. I ran a sand blaster <laughs> one winter. You know, I just kind of been part of the Silver Dollar City family. But I've never found it necessary to say, no, I won't do that. When mm -hmm. somebody says, will you do this? I always want to say, yeah, I'll do that. Wow. It's nice to be useful. It is. <laughs> and you are very useful. <laughs> well, this has just been perfect. Good. I hope you got something you can Oh, use. I did. <laughs> um, and I have a question. Would you mind singing a song? I don't know what song it would be. I could sing uh, a verse of the Jailhouse song. I sure. like to sing Chewing Chaw and Chewing Gum. You ever hear that? Mm -mm, but I like the sound of it. <laughs> that was a Carter family <laughs> song. A.P. Carter, of course, uh, had to copyright on many, many songs. But the folklore is that he didn't write those songs. Mm -hmm. He just went out into the mountains, recorded those songs, for posterity's sake, but he also copy wrote those songs. So when the song Sitting on Top of the World or whatever became a hit song, he was making the money off of it, although he actually just borrowed it from somebody out in the hills. Mm -hmm. So anyway, chewing chawing, chewing gum. I'll sing a little bit of it for you. Chewing chawing gum, chewing chawing gum. Chew and chaw and gum, chew and chaw and gum. I took my girl to church one day. What do you think she'd done? She walked right up in the preacher's face and chewed her chaw and gum. Chew and chaw and gum, chew and chaw and gum. Chew and chaw and gum, chew and chaw and gum. I don't want a doctor. I'll tell you the reason why. He travels around the country making people die. Chew and chaw and gum, chew and chaw and gum, chew and chaw and gum, chew and chaw and gum. I don't want a lawyer, I'll tell you the reason why. Every time he opens his mouth, he tells a great big lie. Chew and chaw and gum, chew and chaw and gum, chew and chaw and gum, chew and chaw and gum. There's the chew and gum song. <laughs> Now, there's a lot of useful information in that song. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was another Carter family record that they made way back in the day. I, I want to mention something else. Okay. A great influence on my life was the two years that I got to work with Rodney Dillard. Mm -hmm. And Rodney had, of course, was in the Darlin family of the Andy Griffith Show. And his band, the Dillards, from Salem, Missouri, were at one time probably the most popular bluegrass band in the world mm -hmm. because they drew a crowd outside the traditional bluegrass fan base. Mm -hmm. uh, they played in California for one thing, and they sold records to people who would never buy a bluegrass record. Mm -hmm. And the Dillards became so popular. He played with the uh, his brother Douglas, who was maybe the best banjo player in the world at the time, wow. and uh, Rodney wrote a lot of great songs, and he was the brunt of the joke. I mean, he was always the person, he, would, he was always the comedic person that they would make fun of, you know, as the old timers would say back in the 30s and 40s. He was the guy with the big shoes, which meant he was a clown of the act. Dean Webb was in that band, and I got to work with Dean Webb. I never worked with Rod or with Del Douglas, but I got to work with Dean Webb a lot. Mm -hmm. And Dean's mandolin player influenced so many mandolin players over the years. And he was a great harmony singer, and he could tell you what harmony line to sing. If you were learning a song, he could tell you what to sing. And uh, Steve Cooley, great banjo player, from Louisville, Kentucky, 
was in the group when I played with Rodney and the Dillards. And that was such a great influence on me because we get together, let's say Wednesday, we get together at Rodney's house and he would play these songs, usually on cassette tape. Here's the songs we're gonna learn this week because we learn new songs every week because we had a radio broadcast every week. So we had to learn new songs. Rodney would assign us, you're gonna sing this, you're gonna sing this. So we learned how to chart the song. He'd play the song, he'd play the recording, and you were expected to make the bar lines and draw, write the chords in as the song was playing. And I learned to do that. And it's a great skill that I still use a lot. And it was a great thing to know. And then to, to divide up the field work. Everybody doesn't play at once. In this mm -hmm. section, the fiddle player does the field work. In this section, the guitar player does the field work. In this, you're gonna, this is how we kick off the song. This is how we end the song. It's like telling a story. It's got to have a beginning. Mm -hmm. It's got to have the meaty part of the middle of it. And it's got to wind up into a cohesive ending. And I think I learned all that from Rodney. And he, I don't think he intended to be my teacher, but looking back, I learned so much from him. Yeah, he was a big influence on me. Him and his wife, Beverly, who was, you know, Beverly is a claw hammer banjo player and a clog dancer from North Carolina. and. Uh, she knows a lot about music and a lot about folk music especially and knew a lot of the old-time players in that area. So between her and Rodney and Dean, and I rode to work with Dean every day when we were doing the radio show. So one day we'd chart the song at Rodney's house. We'd go home and practice and practice and practice. The next time we got together, Rodney wanted to hear the whole thing, start to finish, the whole radio show and he wrote the dialogue and all that stuff. Then the next day, we went to a recording studio and we laid down the tracks. And you had minimum time to lay down the tracks. I mean, you only rented so much studio time and you wanted it to be right. Mm -hmm. And so many times, that group of people went in the studio, heads up, first pass, lots of times. And our fiddle player was a guy named Fred Carpenter who ran the acoustic shop in Nashville for years after that. Fred was just a kid, and even when he was a teenager, he was first chair violin in uh, his home up in Maine where he had, they had a symphony orchestra, and so Fred was the first chair violinist when he was a kid for that orchestra, and he was a bluegrass player. Him and man, he, he played jazz, but he loved bluegrass, and I learned a lot from Fred. One time, Fred bought a new bass boat, and I went fishing with him some. Fred said, do you think I'm foolish to spend this kind of money on a boat? And I said, Fred, if I could play like you, I'd have the best boat I could ever find. <laughs> he was a great player, and of course, he went on to coach a lot of people, and he had the instrument repair shop, and he had practice rooms, and he sold a lot of stringed instruments from down there when he moved to Nashville. So that was a good era of my life. Mm -hmm. Even though it was only two years that I worked with Rodney, it was like a college education. Wow. You do some dancing too, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> you could call it that. <laughs> um, where did you learn to dance? Well, we used to have a barn dance here at Silver mm -hmm. City. Over 20 years we had a barn dance. Wow. And, uh, every year in the fall, for fall festival, we would take either the carousel barn or sometimes Red Gold Hall. We built a big wooden dance floor, and every day we would put cornmeal on the floor so the dancers could scoot around on that wooden floor and the tongue and groove plywood floor. And then we had a stage, and every week we burned a book, a different band. We had bands from Arizona, Texas. Colorado, California a couple times, uh, Oklahoma. We booked these western swing bands that would come up here. So then that allowed us to attract all these dancers mm -hmm. and good swing dancers. We had some amazing dancers. Well, I didn't know how to dance at all and didn't really care to learn how to dance. I'd played music all my life. I would, there was no time to learn how to dance. <laughs> this. Uh, 
lady who I knew was at the barn dance. She came to me during one of the songs and she said, would you waltz with me? I said, I don't know how to waltz. And she said, you're fixing to learn how to waltz. Mm. And she <laughs> taught me to waltz. And then I learned the two-step and I learned all the electric slide and all the, you know, the dances, line dances. And I learned the shotish and polka. Mm. And I learned to do those dances at that barn dance. And uh, that was just so much fun. And then after you know how to dance a little bit, uh, people will dance with you. You can look around the crowd and you know, you see some lady, she's tapping her toe. You think she wants to dance. Mm -hmm. And so you can walk up to her and say, would you dance with me? And usually they will. And so I got to know a lot of people that way. And I got to meet a lot of great dancers. And I got to meet a lot of great musicians. Uh, Herb Remington was one of the most notorious steel players that mm -hmm. ever played. We, he came here one time. I booked Herb Remington's band, and uh, man, it was good. He wrote the Remington Ride and the, all kinds of. Boot Hill Drag was oh, one of the songs he wrote. That song. Great song. And to see Herb Remington play was just a tremendous experience. Uh, didn't Johnny Gimbel come and? Play yes. too. <laughs> Johnny Gimble came here, and uh, the band consisted of Gimble and that Rex Burdett booked Johnny Gimble to come here. I don't, well, we used to go to the Western Music Association, which was a convention that happened in the Southwest. It was in Flagstaff. It was in Albuquerque for a while. It was in Tucson, I think. But uh, Rex and I would go down there to that Western Music Association, and that's where he hooked up with. Johnny Gimble and talked Johnny into coming to Silver Dollar City. The band was Sonny Spencer from Sons of the Pioneers show. Sonny played fiddle and guitar or whatever he wanted to play. And then the rest of the band was Horse Creek Band, which was Butch and Larry and Archie Phillips. And then we had Andy Oberg playing the piano. So about the first day Gimble was at the job, uh, he was calling the tunes and you were just expected to know the tunes. And of course, Butch and Larry and Archie, they knew all those tunes. <laughs> he called Little Rock Getaway. Andy playing the piano. He'd never played Little Rock Getaway. But he kicked it off and played the head, and Johnny pointed at Andy, and Andy played it like he'd played it all of his life. Wow. Played it great, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so I told Andy later, I said, how did you know to do that? He said, I had no choice. <laughs> <laughs> My heart would be racing. <laughs> oh, we had such a time. Wow. It's been a great life at Silver Dollar City. Mm -hmm. I've lived in the fantasy world, both at home and at work, all these years. Wow. Yeah. That's quite a blessing. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that's... Do you have anything else? I could probably go on for years. But <laughs> I think I'll just leave I'd it enjoy that. that. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. Thank you so much, Mr. Calloway. And this has been another edition of Songs of the Ozarks. Thank you all so much for listening and watching.